Get ready to be inspired by Miss Chu. That's all I've got to say. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. Welcome back, listeners, to Australia's, if not the world's, number one small business marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a very, very motivated small business owner ready to crank out some great marketing so that you can build that baby of yours into the empire that it deserves to be. And we are brought to you by the very good folk at Net Registry, and I also want to welcome everyone within the Flying Solo community. I am so, so excited about today's episode. I'm excited about every episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, but I have just knocked out an interview with Miss Chu, who owns a chain, isn't the right word, but I'll say chain of Vietnamese tuck shops in Melbourne, Sydney, and London. And I don't know, it was just one of those interviews that left me singing. I'm feeling good about life. So more on that in a minute. I am also going to cover... On a less happy note, a contentious discussion about the way I treat listener feedback that is happening inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum at the moment, and I am going to share some listener feedback because there is so much of it wonderfully stacking up that uh, I just have to do that. So uh, we have got a very big show. Strap in. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Now... Are you keen to get your online marketing sorted? Oh, sorry, Brian. It's part of the language now. One complaint I hear from small business owners a lot is that they can't catch a break with their online marketing. They'll be having the worst experience with their website developer. The site will keep crashing. The design is nothing like they wanted. I tell them they need to talk to Net Registry because they will get their online marketing sorted. You don't need to be a pro when it comes to the internet because they are. And they make it so simple and straightforward, this whole online marketing thing. Getting you a domain name, your website hosted, whatever you need to be able to market your business online effectively. Google AdWords, SEO, all that type of stuff. And better yet... Because Net Registry are proud sponsors of the show and want to see small business owners succeed, you can take advantage of some fantastic exclusive listener deals. If you head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the Net Registry banner, those deals will be revealed. They're really good. They're about SEO, AdWords, and they are incredibly inexpensive. Got to love Net Registry. I hope you do too. They make this show possible. Thanks, guys. Now, this interview that I am about to share with you, it's not an interview, it's a fireside chat. They're all fireside chats. I don't do interviews. This fireside chat is with Naji Chu, a.k.a. Miss Chu. Now, she is a highly creative and successful owner of Miss Chu Vietnamese Tuck Shops, and they are a very, very cool little business. Go and check out misschu.com.au. So that's M I S S C H U.com.au just to see how cool this business is. Check this. Founded in 2008, 2009, she now has eight stores one in London, one in the Opera House in Sydney. Turnover $25 million, 280 staff already, and a brilliantly, brilliantly strong brand. You know, in 1975, Miss Chu, or Naji, as I started to call her, that changes, listen to the interview, escaped a brutal dictatorship in Laos and arrived in Australia by boat three years later. So this is such a beautiful story of struggle, of determination, of passion and creativity. So excited to bring this to you. And I started off by asking Naji what to call it. I keep it pretty simple, and I answer to Miss Chu. Right. What happens, yeah. when, what happens if and when you get married? It's Miss Chu, because as a Vietnamese lady, and as part of my culture, the woman always retains her maiden name. Ah. So I'll forever be Miss Chu. You will be? Yeah. 
Oh, if I love I, it. If I marry a Mr. Backer, I'll be Chew Backer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, insert boom tish. I love that. So I'm still looking out for Mr. Backer. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm going to make it now my life's mission to find Actually, you, Mr. Um, Backer. Well, or, or Packer. James Packer will do. That'll I, do. I wouldn't mind being a Chew Packer. Yeah. Or we could find someone called E Gum. To E Gum, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, this is the two. Yeah, this is the great thing about having a surname like Chew. Yeah, exactly Sizeable, right. Isn't it? You can have a lot of fun. We clearly, and I want to come to this shortly, but you have a lot of fun with with your native language, your mother tongue, so to speak. I love the way you've integrated that into your brand. But let's come to that in a minute because there's many people listening from around the world miss Chew, and I'm going to call you that. It feels a little bit weird, but I'm going to go with it. Mm-hmm. There's many people around the world listening in who haven't been to one of your tuck shops. Yeah. So can you explain? So my, my real name's Nazi Chew, um, and surname being. Miss Chu, C H U. Correct. Yeah. And how lucky was that? Pretty lucky. Really lucky. Some things are meant to be. Exactly. Can can you You explain? It's like people say if you get dealt lemons, sell lemonade. Exactly right. Always the opportunist. You just sit there at some point go, well, my surname is a verb for eating, so I'm just going to start a cafe. At one point, I kind of was toying around with the idea and we were having a joke about it when I was sewing. Um, I was 19 years old working in fashion and uh, a friend of mine said, imagine if you had um, a catering business because, I mean, I'm a, you know, I've, I've worked in catering anyway and even when I was 19, I was supplementing my meagre income by doing some catering work and uh, a friend of mine was joking around and he said, if you had your own catering business, you could, like, your tagline could be choose, choose, choose. He was nearly there. Yeah. He missed it, though. It was right in front of him. It was mm. missed you every day of the week. Exactly. I'm just thinking, God, imagine if I'd gone down the road based on my surname. My surname's Reed, so, like, I'd be like a librarian or something. Or maybe a bookshop owner. A good yeah. read. A good read is what I'd a call the business. Re- yeah, you could be a bookshop owner, for sure. Although yeah. they're not doing that well these days. They're not, are they? It what a be an pity. online um, reading platform. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can you, and I'd love you to introduce some kind of bookshop to your tuck shops because uh, we are, it's a part of our society that's now missing. Yeah, I mean, so your name's Reed, R E A D. It's R E I D. R E I D. But I'd change it. If I did did start a bookshop, I'd go to um, wherever I go to change my name and kind of get that sorted. Hey, listen, more about you. Many people are listening going, (laughs) <laughs> what are these two people talking about? But yeah. t- explain the experience of going to one of your tuck shops. Um, okay, so uh, I've I branded myself Miss Chu, um, M-I-S-S-C-H-U, and a lot of people spell it with, uh, I, you know, with two words. But um, I've turned it into a brand by joining the, the Miss Chu into one word, so it's Miss Chu. Mm-hmm. Um, I've called it a tuck shop uh, because the first door I opened happens to be right next door to a private school. And I just thought it was so cute that, you know, come 3.15, there'd be like a swag of schoolgirls lining up. And uh, that was basically the impetus to start calling myself a tuck shop. Great. Um, and it was also because... Uh, I was getting a lot of foodies coming to line up at Miss Chu, um, and I thought it's inevitable that a um, a foodie writer, like a um, what do you call him? A, a, well, I was going to say gourmand, but like a critic. A critic would come along and start giving me a score, which is something I really didn't want to do because mm-hmm. there are no, you know, there's no indoor seating. It literally is on the street, so therefore. Hence the street food, the um, street, the Vietnamese street food element of uh, my brand. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that's so the I same for a, every one of your venues, is it? It's it's just like it's like a, a tuck t- shop. Yeah. Every and single one. Yep. Every single one now is called a tuck shop, and that's really it's about me keeping the food honest. Um, I'm not about winning awards. I'm not about um, fine dining. It literally is um, Miss Chu. I started as a caterer and then I turned it into a retail experience because there was such a massive demand for it. Um, on my first site, people were banging down the doors, literally, so much so wow. I had to replace the door because it got so loose after trading there as a caterer for the first year. 
And um, and then a lot of these people got really frustrated because I wasn't open to the public. So after one year of trading on this site in Darlinghurst, I opened up the shop to uh, locals. Mm. And within the first few weeks, there were people lining up at the, um, at, you know, well, people lining up at this window. So mm. I literally opened up the window and put a um, bamboo awning out the front to draw attention. And it just went skyrocketing from day one. Can, can um, I, you know what, because there's no shortage, and I've heard you speak about this, um, there's, there's no shortage of Vietnamese restaurants in this world, right? But what you created, what you did differently, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was a real experience. Yeah, what, what I've created was, um, I mean, look, there are a lot of Vietnamese restaurants in Australia. My auntie has a couple of Vietnamese restaurants. I grew up working for her in her restaurants. But what I found um, was missing was the storytelling and the history behind the Vietnamese um, diaspora in Australia, the, the cultural elements. You know, like Australia says, we're so multicultural. And what they're really referring to is we're multicultural because we have a gamut of uh, multicultural foods. What they're not referring to is the fact that there are lots of multicultural communities in Australia, which basically means there are lots of cultural elements to Australia, and that is the culture and the politics of Australia is very varied, and we need to celebrate that. And what I was finding about Australia was that we weren't celebrating Mm. these cultural elements We were celebrating and we were loving their foods, but we left the culture behind. And what I was saying and rebelling against um, society was, hey, if you love my food, I'm afraid you're going to have to love me as well because I'm a Vietnamese Australian. And did you know that I came here as a refugee? And did you know that Australia was also built on the back of other refugees and migrants? So why is it that we're having such a massive media presence and, uh, and a stupid dialogue about... Uh, you know, the negativity of migrants and refugees in this country. Um, so that's, that's where the branding of Miss Chu came from. It basically was saying, hey, it's time for us to start celebrating Vietnamese food. Um, so not only was it just a beautiful name and a celebration of my surname and the fact that it was a verb and it meant eating, what I then went to do was I put my um, refugee visa on the front page of my menu so you were forced to look at this image, which was quite beautiful, and it's actually mm. it's a literal scan of my refugee visa, which allowed me to enter in 1978. And then if you flip to the back, it says um, Miss Chu visa menu. So I really was trying to push the refugee and the visa element yeah, to, right. to the business. I wasn't a brand back then. This is, mind you, this is 2009. I'd only just started the business. And then what I I then went to do was I went, okay, let's now turn to the face, which was just me on that visa, because the visa is actually my brother, my two brothers, I mean my father, my two brothers and me. And then I went, let's now just take my face and pull that to the forefront and turn that into an actual logo. Mm. Um, So now it's a very strong and recognisable face. Yes, it sure is. When you see it on repetition, it becomes a, a brand. Um, and, you know, I put, um, I put colour and mousse into it. Um, the experience of coming to Miss Chew really is about lining up uh, for your food. It's very fast-paced. Um, there's always funky music playing, so it gives you a, um, a very fun and vibey experience. You know, as you're, um, as you're speaking, in one of my family, we often go to a Vietnamese restaurant up in Abbotsford in Melbourne, uh, mm-hmm. and I look at those places now, just in just in this conversation, and thinking they've all they've all westernised themselves. The food's Vietnamese, I guess it's traditional Vietnamese. I'm, you know, maybe it's been westernised, but as as a venue, it's just a Western venue. It's just like tables and chairs, and there's nothing really outside of the people that's that's really uh, truly a cultural experience. Where, and that's, that's your point of difference, isn't it? My, yeah, exactly. My point of difference is definitely that. You really get the sense of uh, I could be anywhere in Asia right now, um, although you know, there is that uh, um, modern design element, which is a nod to the Vietnamese um, streetscape and the alleyways of Vietnam. Mm. Um, yeah. I did the cool. I, I digress, but I um, I was in Ho Chi Minh last year, and I did the coolest food tour on the back of a motorbike. Oh uh, yeah, 
Yeah, this is it, what I'm doing right now. Yeah, it was with Exo Tours, and it was yep. a marketing. I've used it as a marketing case study in my um in my keynotes. Where mm-hmm. God, it was brilliant, and we went for six hours to all the different. I think it's called precincts. Yeah, and uh, tried all the different foods and some of those back alleys and yeah, your ability to ma- bring that back. I mean, well done. I mean, yeah, just exactly. to be so um. Just to be to, to honour where you've come from in such a strong way. It, yeah. We don't. See, there's not enough experiences in in Mark in the way businesses deliver their offer. And you know, listeners have heard me say so often. You know, there's no shortage of marketing blokes. There's no shortage of dentists, of plumbers, of masseurs. And it's how we how we take our offer to market. It's uh, always the one that yeah has the story and another authenticity that stands yeah. out. Um, Absolutely. So, like you were just saying about the Vietnamese tour, I've just devised a misguided culinary tour of Vietnam. Misguided? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, a play on words is important. It it makes, you know, like, I mean, branding and marketing is one, has to be one word that stays in someone's mind. Yeah. And then it always has to have a a tagline. Okay, so the tagline emphasises and reiterates what your business does. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well, like give us your tagline for your delivery service because I love it. So it's Miss Chu Yu Ling Wei Bling. Yeah. It's yep. controversial. Um, it's a play on words. Some people think it's racist when it's not actually at all. It's breaking down stereotypes faster than uh, a historian could, or a politician, um, yep. or a lobbyist. Uh, and, you know, it's basically said on the back of my name, the person, and it also leads you to the website that always puts it into context. It's a Vietnamese woman. She does Asian food, and she brings you the food because she, she specialises in takeaways and home delivery. I, I, I love how you have the whole use of language of taking it's not taking the mickey because what i'm about to say on what you what you've written on your website says not to take the mickey let me explain on your website you say we kindly request that you see this use of language by the miss Chu brand as a humorous toying with not a handing over of power to exactly. those who wish to mock asian accents and um fully get that and but i i, I love how you've kind of it's seen empowering. the humor yeah. in the way us westerners maybe pronounce uh, and imitate, you know, the Vietnamese language or any other Asian language, but you've kind of turned it around and just made it fun? Uh, Yeah, exactly. That's right. It has to... You have to do that. Um, It's the only way to get around a a negative issue, like Mm. refugees, for example. You know, it's a negative issue right now, but I've really turned it on its head and I've made the word refugee fun, and sustainable and viable and, you know, quirky. And um, I've made people look at the word refugee with a heartbeat. Um, I've, I've put personality through the Vietnamese person and the Vietnamese brand, you know. So, mm. you know, once upon a time, people would uh, look at a Vietnamese store and go, oh, you know, let's... I mean, I love their food, but I, I hate their designs. You know, I hate the bright lights, I hate the yeah. music. Um, I hate the dirtiness, and yep. I've I've really corrected all of those issues, but still retained the culture, what it is to be a Vietnamese person. In fact, what I've done is I've celebrated and um, highlighted what it truly is to be a Vietnamese person in Australia, mm, mm. Um, and I, I celebrated it. You know, and, and I've asked people to come along for the ride and celebrate that with me because, I mean, you know, my success is actually all on the back of my customers anyway. I've got so many questions for you. <laughs> but We've only got half an hour. I know, so I know. the crux of this <laughs> half an hour, which is, what is it, marketing and branding? Correct. Well, that's where I want to go. So another thing I've heard you say, no market research or business planning around this business. It's simply an extension of myself. Is yeah. that true? It is absolutely true. I get out of bed and I'm me. Um I happen to be very good at marketing and branding. Um, you happen to be also highly creative. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, so, so what do you say to and and you know when we were when you were asking me you know what are we going to talk about and I said well you know I just admire the way you've built this brand so much and I see many small business owners that haven't um, had the courage to own an idea or to even have an idea. Well, this is it. You just nailed it. You have to own it. 
that the one most important crucial element of marketing and branding is to be a uh, um, what would they say uh, a disturber oh yep a disruptor a disruptor yeah yep. because disruptors make people notice but disruptors also must have conviction and belief yep um, and you need to own that belief and this this, that disruptive um, message that you're doing. So yep. you can't do it for the sake of marketing. You're doing it because you actually believe in it. Mm. Mm. Um, so if you don't believe in your product, I mean, it's very, very difficult to sell a product unless you have absolute conviction in it. So when you have an idea, Miss Chu, about, for example, like going back to the experience, I mean, tuck shop type venues you, you apparently ordering is like putting a lunch order in at school exactly. so when yeah. you have an idea like it's like oh that sounds like a good idea we could you know just like we used to do at school write on a brown paper bag and hand it you know wrap it up and put the money in it and you know so when you have an idea like that which you know in retrospect in hindsight that just makes sense but when you first hear it you go well that's a bit scary no one does that Oh, that's the, that's the most amazing thing. That's a bit scary. No one does that. I find excitement in that. That's yeah. the challenge. Yeah. If no one's done it before, that's it. You have to do something no one's done before. It, that's, that's where marketing and branding happens. You've got to absolutely make sure that no one's done it before, and then you go to work and make it a really strong thing. Yeah. You start putting an image to it that's really strong. You own that idea, and you say to the market, I am the originator of this idea, like I have done. I mean, look, it took a Vietnamese girl to come into this country and see the, the beauty in the name Tuck Shop. You know, I've made the word Tuck Shop very famous and very trendy now. Do you know how many cafes there are right now opening up and they're calling themselves a Tuck Shop? That's a Sydney thing. They, they copy up there. Yeah. I mean, they're doing it in Melbourne as well. Oh, are they? But um, I don't claim to have invented the word touch shop, but I will lay claim to being the first woman in Australia to have taken the touch shop outside of the school zone and make it a very viable venture and turn the word touch shop into a brand. Yep. Yeah, um, and, and again, own that word. Like, and you it, own it. Yeah. What about brand management, Miss Chu? Like, how, how I've come from a corporate marketing background of 20 years, and it's like, you know, brand managers are there. They're like the, the brand Nazi. You know, you can't, you got to use that color, and you got to use that font, and you got to use that language, and you got to, yeah. you know, are you, do you stand over this and just make sure yeah. that, it, yeah, you're there's really strict? Only, um, there, there are two people in my office. Um, today, there's only me, unfortunately. Because my PA works for an animal shelter part time, because you know, like she she loves doing things like that. And then the other person who works in the marketing department is my graphic designer. And so our, we're the only two people who do brand management, marketing. I do my social media. Um, and what we say to our staff is, don't come to work in those shoes because it's the wrong colour. Remember, we have a hue that we all abide to. Oh wow! Grey, white, green. Black, uh, anything that's not within those hues will confuse the market. And it's very, very subtle. These nuances are really, really important. Um, all of our marketing that goes out has a, uh, a correct color green. Um, everything is branded as a passport. Everything is branded as a visa. It's got stamps on it. Um, so I say to my staff, you know, when, when the look and feel of Miss Chu is travel, passports, visas, refugees, School, tuck shop. Okay, if you want, if you put all those elements together, you will have a strong brand. Um, do you have some kind of induction, or do you, yes, you obviously we, employ people who get it? Uh, look, it's cut, it's gotten to a stage where we do have an induction manual, um, definitely. Uh, but you know, the business is only five years old, so I've, I've I've been winging it right up until now, and I'm still winging it. <laughs> Pardon the pun, because yeah, yeah, I did yeah. say that I was planning on going into the travel industry. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, branding is, branding and marketing is that know what your product is and mm. then know how you want it to look. You must be absolutely sure of that before you start releasing yourself into the market. 
Um, I often talk about the, the idea of building a brand is like, I use the analogy of like we're doc- as, as business owners and brand builders, we're like Dr. Frankenstein in that we are building a monster, albeit a friendly monster, hopefully, but we can control what it looks like, what it wears, how it speaks, yeah. when it speaks. We, I like we, the, an- the, yeah, the, the analogy. The analogy is very correct. Yeah. I mean, like the media, for example, the media loves to portray me as the Nazi. So whenever they interview me, um, on TV or whatnot, they ask me to stand at the window and yell at customers. Um, so, is that you know, weird? It, it's weird because I say to them, you know, that's actually really not the brand. Um, that's the person that you remember, and I know that that sells and that rates, but um, it's not me. I'm actually a very kind soul, and I yell at people, and I used to yell at people because they didn't get me. You know, they they didn't get me because they thought that a Vietnamese person actually belongs out in Cabramatta. Mm. Um, they thought that a Vietnamese person was more submissive than I was, and I was quite outspoken. Um, you know, they thought that a Vietnamese product should cost $3, whereas my rice paper rolls cost $6, mm-hmm. which I thought was still quite inexpensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, my baguettes cost um, $8, and when they were, they were like, you know, but it's $4 out in Cabramatta. I'm like, well, go to Cabramatta and get a $4 baguette. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right, and spend 10 bucks in petrol. Yeah, exactly, and it'll take you two hours to get there. You, you have uh, you launched in 2009, five years down the track, eight stores, one in London, one in the Opera House, 25 million turnover, 280 staff. Tell me about the longest sleepless night you had in, that last, in those last five years. Um, I probably can't say. I, I Which have one? had very... Well, recently I'm suing somebody for a large sum of money. Mm-hmm. So I'm having a long and sleepless nights right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's a business That's a business thing? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so we can't go into that, but what about in bringing the business, and maybe that is related to bringing the business to life, but early days you started off with 1200 bucks. You, I don't know how you start a business with that, like, well done to you. But oh, you, easy. Th- you start th- small and let it grow organically. Right. Reinvest the profits. Well, literally, I started with $1,500 in my pocket. Um, I left the bank and I went on a Vipassana meditation course for 10 days. I came out of those 10 days and decided that I was going to make rice paper rolls and wholesale and to caterers. I looked up on the internet and uh, found the biggest caterer was actually at the Opera House. I rang up the executive chef and I said, Hi, I'm new in town. I make rice paper rolls, canapé size. I'm really good at it and I'd like a meeting. And he said, Love your conviction. So I went and saw him the next day with a box of samples. Um, and he said, Love it. When can I have my first order? And um, I said, Tomorrow. And he said, where do you operate from? And I, I blindly, I just lied. I said, I have a commercial kitchen. Hmm. And he said, yep, done. Actually had, I was making them from home in Balmain. Oh, I love it. And uh, so his first order was 30 rolls and the second order was 120 rolls. By the second week, he was ordering 900 units per day. Three months down the track, he was ordering 1,500 units per day. And then by New Year's Eve, which was only three months after operating, um, I had three caterers call me. And overnight, on New Year's Eve, I was making 17,000 rolls within eight hours, and that was only three caterers. So I'd grown within three months from an order of 30 units to 17,000 units. And then uh, the first year's income was $90,000. The second year's income was from the, the shop that I had hired in Darlinghurst, that's 2009. So the first year was 2008 from home. Mm-hmm. Um, so 2009 was when I went proper and hired a shop. You got late. serious? I got serious. What, at what point did you tell the bloke at the opera house that, hey, we haven't really got a commercial kitchen? I never did. <laughs> never did. I just winged it. And Good I, on I you. knew. But I, well, I just knew. I knew what HACCP was. I know that when you get to that stage, you have to have a HACCP license, which is ha- health hazard analysis, critical control points. And, I, you know, I've come from hospitality. I've been a caterer in Melbourne. Mm. I, I have studied HACCP and I have gone as far as you can go with health and um, hygiene. So I knew exactly what I was doing. I just needed to start from somewhere. Mm-hmm. 
And that's what I did. I started from a very small place and from home and then just um, grew organically since then. Oh, Miss Chu, we got... I have so many listeners that um, either are stuck stuck in the cubicle with a big business idea that they're dying to bring to market. I have I could other- help them. I mean, I'm really good with names and how to brand. I um, love naming they, too. They, yeah, exactly. Do you want to start they a naming can- business? Yeah, you know, I, I find excitement in that. Um, someone like someone made a joke with me. I was doing a talk at um, a conference, and this guy put up his hand, and he said, "Yeah, but I'm disabled," you know, and he had one arm. And um, how, you know, like, what would you do if you were someone like me who's disabled, don't have much? And I said, well, you, you, clearly you speak really well. You can ask a question really well. You've obviously got brains. You came to this conference to listen to me speak. You put up your hand and asked a question. The only thing you don't have is an arm. And I said, well, you know, why don't you sell arms? And he just stood there and laughed and went, Sell you- arms. And said, yeah, sell weapons. Oh, uh, yeah, that's what I thought arms. you meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, just take the piss out of yourself yep. and make it a marketing plan and turn turn a bad point into a really positive, strong point and really own it. There's not enough humour in this world, Miss Chu. Yeah, yeah. Humour mm. humor with, um, with conviction and something that, you know, like, I mean, a business has to have a heartbeat as well, don't forget. It has to make a difference to the world. You know, like yeah, a yeah. cookbook. I mean, Jesus, you know, I don't have a cookbook. Does the world really need another Doesn't cookbook? Doesn't need another one. Do not do one. We need we need another cookbook like we need another parking ticket. Yeah, yeah. No, we're all Unless out of cookbooks. Unless it's got a purpose behind it. Yeah, you know, I and agree. That is, so the purpose behind my next cookbook, and I'm still trying to get a publisher to agree with me, mm-hmm. and I have found one. It took me 12 months for a publisher to agree that 5% of the profits has to go towards a philanthropic um, uh, foundation that I believe in. That was really a discussion? That's like a question. That's like, yeah, okay, fine. Next. Yeah, well, you know, so many of them said no way because as if your book's going to make a profit. And I said, well, I know oh, it's not wow. going to make a profit, but at least, you know, what about 5% turnover? They said, no, that's way too much money. And I was like, Jesus, come on. Oh, wow. You don't, yeah, well, you yeah. just you find another publisher. In fact, what you do is self-publish, and then you will make a profit. Hello to all yeah, the publishers I that I know. Yeah, self-publishing was going to take too much work. So what I did, what I did in the end was um, I said that 5% of the, um, of the proceeds of the book will go towards philanthropy, and that will come from my pocket. But 5% of the content of the book must have something that drives people to donate. I don't want to finish this interview on a down note. I don't think it will be, but I'm fascinated to understand you have you you came from you had a tough childhood. That's an understatement. Um, you know, you arrived at Australia coming out of a Thai refugee camp, leaving your home country that was under a dictatorship. I mean, you know, like we don't have to go into great detail about what a dark place you must you and your family must have been in. Um, how how did you recover your sense of humour? and maintain it even today when you reflect back on those times? And I ask that for the bloke in the wheelchair and for other people who are doing it tough. Um, I think when you go through trauma, um, people deal with recovery in different ways. And I think a lot, of, a lot of people use comedy to recover from a tragedy, and that's what I've done as well. I think comedy is really important. Comedy, I think, is probably one of the most powerful medicines one could have. Oh, how good is a good laugh? How It's like taking an, an ecstasy. Well, yeah. You know, like, well, I, I used to <laughs> in my youth, but I, know, I, I can remember the sensations. Yeah. And there's nothing Didn't like... Inhale. There's nothing like having a good laugh. It really just cures everything. Oh, it's, it's just one of the... stomach up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Love getting the giggles, particularly yeah. when it's an uncontrollable and your shoulders start to shake and, you know, it just becomes like, oh, yeah, well. Everything works. All the muscles in your yeah. body work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, I can't wait to do uh, – listen, Miss Chu and I are doing a road show around Australia for, for, uh, for Westpac in the coming weeks, so we're going to have a lot of fun. And I think um, we should come up with some names. Maybe we just – we're going to call the business Sticky Names. All right? Excellent. You happy with that? Fantastic. And uh, I don't know what we're going to name, but we'll name something. Maybe someone could send us in a, in a request names. to name something. For, for moments that are sticky. For sticky moments. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> for when you're stuck. Yeah. Love it. Hey, Miss Chu, I love your work. And, and you've shared Thanks, some Kim. You've shared some gold. 
uh, with us, and I really appreciate that. Thanks and for I know listening, that, everybody. Yeah, good on you. Uh, and I know listeners are going to have a lot of comments, so if they do, I'll uh, I'll flick them your way, and you can you can. Uh, By maybe... all means, do go to the website, and I I answer all the emails, so um, yeah, invariably they'll come to me anyway. Thank you, Miss Chu. Great, thanks, Tim. Wow. That's all I can say. I hope you enjoyed that fireside chat as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Now, before I give you my top three learnings, as if there aren't more, I want to let you in on a little secret that smart business owners everywhere are on to. If you've got marketing materials lying around that need a little tweaking, maybe the details on your business card need updating or your logo needs altering. Maybe you need to change the colour of that beige shirt you accidentally wore in the photo shoot. No worries at all. That'll be $19, and it'll be done in less than an hour, thanks to Swiftly.com. Small design fixes fast. That is how they roll. You simply upload your artwork that needs fixing, tell them what needs doing, and boom, one hour and 19 bucks later, it's done. Check them out at swiftly.com. That is S-W-I-F-T-L-Y dot com. Now, I don't know about you, but I could have listed... Well, A, I could have spoken to Miss Chu for a lot, lot longer. Like, I'm talking hours. And B, there are a lot more than three learnings that I took from that chat with her. However, let me share my top three. Number one, disrupt the marketplace. I think that's brilliant and there should be more of it. Number two, have conviction of your ideas. Own your ideas and really lean into them. You know, you might, you know, I love the fact, the other thing, the third tip, by the way, is If no one's done it, then it's a good idea. So come up with an idea. Ask yourself if it's done before. If it hasn't been done before, then guess what? It might be a really good idea. And there'll be naysayers. There'll be people who say, oh, don't do that. It's never been done like that. That could be really good reason to do it. And you kind of consider some past guests of this show, and they've all disrupted the category. They've all challenged the category, and they've all gone against convention. So I love that. I reckon there should be more of it. And I really would love to hear what ideas came out of that fireside chat for you. So head over to the show notes of episode 186 at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and leave a comment, a feedback. Maybe there's a question you would have loved me to ask. I can always ask Miss Chu to come back and answer the question in the show notes. You know, maybe there's just something you want to feed back to me after that interview. I'd love to hear what you've got to say. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com Right, so let's get stuck into this contentious issue that is listener reviews. Um, as I mentioned uh, a couple of episodes ago on Funny Business, I was talking to Griffo about the fact that, you know, uh, I got an email from one of my forum members actually saying, hey, Timbo, I don't like the way you get celebrities to read reviews that you get on iTunes. And I kind of thought, oh, I think it's a bit fun. And Griffo and I agreed it was a bit fun, but... Inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum, people are saying, not so fun. And uh, here's some of the comments that I'm getting. Uh, Meppy Man, who started the conversation, uh, posted it in the forum, and he's got some support from the tribe. And Laurie's saying, uh, I'm with you, Mark, but uh, I don't hate them. But personally, I prefer just having Timbo read them. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, at the back end of episodes, I would get... um, uh, people who can do celebrity uh, voices to read reviews that I get on iTunes. And um, I thought it was a bit of fun, but uh, clearly not. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, Hop and Vine within the forum says, they don't really do much for me. I tend to skip them. I'm much more likely to listen to them when Tim reads them out. Sarah says, I love hearing the testimonials. I think they should continue, maybe even before the outro, but I definitely think that it's nice for Timbo to read them. Happy Chappy says, I would prefer to hear Timbo read them. Danny Danny says the same. Sean says the same. Sean goes as far as saying the tribe has spoken, Timbo. So listen, um, yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. The kind of overall feeling was that I was 
not giving them the love and attention they deserve and was cheapening them by getting celebrity voiceovers to do it. So I am going to read some reviews, and I'm not going to read reviews just for the sake of, you know, oh, Timbo, love the show, you're ace, but I think there's learnings and uh, confirmation in them for you, the listener, to see what other people think as well and where other small business owners are at in their business. So this one is from Sherry, and she says, Hey there, Timbo. Your ears must be burning on a regular basis. I love your podcast and anxiously wait for Tuesdays to roll around so that I can get inspired and enlightened. It's a big learning for me, actually, um, that whole Tuesday thing. I do my darndest to get a show out each Tuesday. And it's that regularity. So if you are into into the habit of creating content, then the idea is to push something out on a regular basis. And if it's going to be a Friday afternoon, then put it out on a Friday afternoon. If it's going to be a Tuesday, put it out on a Tuesday. But what happens is you develop an expectation amongst your readership, your listening audience, your viewers, whoever it may, whatever it may be, that oh, and they start to look forward to it. And that's a good thing for your brand. Uh, Now, Cherie goes on to say, and I must tell at least two people a week about what I've learned. In fact, just emailing a link to one of your podcasts right now. That's great. Again, if you create useful, engaging content, people will share it, right? So compare that to advertising. No one rings you and says, oh, I love that ad you put in the local paper. Do you mind if I email it to my friends? That doesn't happen. But if you create engaging content, it does. Cherie, back to Cherie. After my brave jump into the world of the startup, I found you. Now I take you with me up Mount Tabor. Each morning with my lovely Newfie, Abu. I'm guessing a Newfie's a dog, and I'm guessing Abu is the name of Cherie's dog. So uh, what a lovely thing to do. I join lots of people on their walks. I hear from emails and things. You're awesome. You're great. You're generous. You're passionate about marketing, and it shows. Someday I hope to grow up and be just like you. That's all. Uh, thank you, Cherie. And Cherie's from Shoe Fits Marketing. All right. Uh, here is one from... Brian, I touched on uh, this email in last week's episode. Uh, I think it's quite funny. So this is from Brian Morris. Now, Brian says, Hey, Tim, Brian Morris here. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for your great show. The content is brilliant and always right on the money. And there's always a but, though, isn't there? Hey, here comes the but. I have been wondering lately if your sponsor, Net Registry, is a pommy business, as you almost always use a pommy accent when you say, get your online marketing sorted. <laughs> and that really annoys him. I have to say, it's only a small grumble, but when you use the accent, I feel quite irritated. And I wonder if it could turn off some of their potential customers. Oh, I don't know, Brian. I think you're looking too far into it, mate. If I get a whole barrow, a whole swag of emails saying, Timbo, if you say sorted one more time in a pommy accent, I'll stop listening to the show. Then I will stop listening. But I'm not one for listening to the feedback of one and taking it to heart. It's when the majority speak, like they have in the forum, about the way I have previously treated listener feedback. Um, Brian very kindly goes on to say, I listen to your podcast while I'm on my day job as a haul truck operator on the mines in Western Australia. I know a few uh, listeners who are doing that kind of thing. The great content is helping grow my little hobby business in my downtime, and I know in about 24 months' time it will be my full-time gig. I sincerely hope this email hasn't offended you, as it really is a brilliant podcast and your efforts are appreciated. Brian, I used to be easily offended. I used to have a soft skin. Now I've got a hard skin. Not offended at all, mate. Love the feedback. Love the fact that you reached out and um, and made contact because that's kind of what I like. You know, when you're talking behind a microphone in a dark, dingy room, it's nice to know that there are people out there who respond. This one is from Talita. I like this one from Talita. She says, hey, Timbo, love your podcast. You know, I'm about to review it on iTunes. Love that. Thank you, Talita. 
please, listeners, if you do get the opportunity, I, you know, if there's one thing you did for me besides, you know, send me to the tropics for a week, it would be to review my podcast on iTunes. Talita says, thank you for your endless enthusiasm. I, too, love woo-woo. Can't get enough of it. Yeah, sometimes I apologise when I get a bit woo-woo in my marketing advice, but, hey, marketing's emotional. It's a little bit spiritual and sometimes rational, so uh, stick with that. I am so energised by your efforts, Timbo. I just bought a waterproof. How's this, eh? I love this. I just bought a waterproof Bluetooth speaker so I can kick off my day with a Timbo boost while I am getting ready in the bathroom. Oh, Talita, Talita. What a great name, Talita. It's kind of like American Indian name. Maybe not. I'm probably completely wrong there. Toledo's from 8 Seconds. Marketing for all businesses. Oh, another marketing consultant there, Toledo. So thank you for those very, very kind words, everyone. So there it is. Some listener feedback read by me. And uh, as I said previously, it is it is stacking up. If you want to um, send me some feedback or, you know, comment, whatever, marketing question, um, you can go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and hit the contact button and you can send me an email. I read them all. And uh, if you feel like reviewing my show on iTunes, go and do that right now. Okay, team of motivated small business owners, that is about it. I'm recording this before I go to LA, although it will run after I'm back from LA. So, um, I hope to share my experiences with you whilst over there. Um, lots. Uh, I'm giving a keynote talk on the Monday. I'm doing a couple of other things and then having a look around. I'm expecting to see some pretty amazing little marketing tips and tricks while I wander around California. IA. So uh, stay tuned for that. There is the Small Business Big Marketing Facebook. So you can head over there and I'll be posting some stuff on there. Join the forum. I'll be talking about what I'm seeing inside the forum. Love to see you inside there. You can join by uh, going to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and clicking on the forum button to buck for the first seven days. So why wouldn't you? Big thanks to Net Registry for helping get your online, getting your online marketing sorted swiftly for those small design fixes done real fast. And I have got some ripper, and I mean ripper interviews coming up. A little bit hush hush on exactly what. I'll keep you guessing. But I can assure you that uh, you have reason to be excited. Enough. I'm Timbo Reed, and you have been smart enough to tune in to the world's number one small business marketing show. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show.